everybody, welcome back to Witch Fix. If you can hear children screaming, don't worry. <laughs> anyway, today we're launching into another Lauren Miracle book. This is debatably book two or book one in the Crestview series, but it's the book that goes along with Rhymes with Witches, which I have previously reviewed. And although Goodreads told me to read uh, Rhymes with Witches first, I feel like that was misleading because apparently Rhymes with Witches came out first, like chronologically in terms of when it was published but it is set after bliss so bliss is basically a prequel and was thus kind of spoiled for me by the reading of rhymes with witches first so bear that in mind obviously if you already listened to the rhymes with witches review you're gonna be spoiled anyway so just read them in whatever order you want but if you're some sort of johnny flying by the seat of your pants and you've decided to listen to this episode first for some reason don't know why, but if you're one of those people, you can choose which one you want to read first. So good on you for flying in the face of convention, uh, which is sort of a theme of the book, to be honest. So this book, Bliss, uh, is named after the main character, Bliss. Uh, Bliss in the Morning Dew is her full name because her parents are hippies and this book is set in the 1960s. Her parents have recently fled to Canada to get out of the draft for the Vietnam War and she has been stuck in the south with her very conservative grandmother and is now going to a real high school for the first time and experiencing teen life and to be honest I felt like that was enough for a novel in itself it was quite an original idea it was not one I had read before and it added quite a lot of life and interest to the story which I, otherwise I don't think would have been there because this is easily twice the length of Rhymes with Witches it's several hundred pages long nearly over 400 pages i think without that added aspect of it being set in the 60s it wouldn't have had as much ground to cover to fill those pages and therefore the the plot would have dragged a lot more i found it dragged a little there were aspects that i think it could have been sped up a little bit but i think that was mostly because i already kind of knew what was going to happen because i had read rhymes with witches so the story then bliss starts going to crestview high which is uh, a former nunnery which has become a high school and is very quickly torn between two groups there's some semi-popular girls they're not top of the food chain but they're sub top of the food chain who take an interest in her who find her inability to know anything about teenage life quite quaint and she also begins to be uh, befriend a downtrodden girl called sandy who she sees one day helping a girl who's fallen down to, to get back up and feels sorry for her because everyone in the school hates Sandy. She's the butt of a lot of jokes. She's very strange in her behaviour, very reclusive, not particularly well-dressed or very hygienically presented and a little bit overweight. So she doesn't have a lot going for her in terms of high school popularity. And Bliss, in her kind of hippie-ish, we should embrace our brothers and sisters kind of way, sets out to befriend Sandy. And for the majority of the book kind of has an alternate day arrangement where she spends some time with Sandy and the rest of the time with her popular friends, but feels kind of torn between the two groups as she tries to navigate the social strata of high school. I will say, uh, and I'll give a trigger warning for this, there's discussion of like a lot of racism in the book because of when it's set. Um, so I'm going to trigger one for mentions of racism and lynchings. Uh, there's also mentions of sexual assault, sexual abuse, murder. Uh, they get into the um, murders of like Sharon Tate and all, all, all that other stuff. So there's discussion of quite a bit of murder in the book. Also some ableism. Uh, there's quite a lot of stuff to, to warn about, but um, go into that full ward. The structure of the book is quite interesting. We get chapters with bliss and in between the chapters there are these black pages that have quotes on them from uh, contemporary advertisements or from um, a lot of them are from a show that I have never seen and don't know about because I'm not American the Andy Griffith show um, I'm given to understand that's where Maybury comes from like the whole concept of like Maybury is like the perfect town could be wrong. There's also stuff about Nixon, about the Vietnam War, stuff about racism, including like folk songs and things like that. The Charles Manson family cult stuff mainly comes in because of Sandy, who has a mild obsession with Charles Manson uh, and the murders that are being investigated and the trial that's going on throughout the novel. Uh, I think the timescale of that has been changed and it says in the author's note that she's worked it so that it fits with the timeline of the novel, which I'm not mad about you know it's creative license that's what you do um and sandy's kind of 
obsessed with him not because of the, the murders and the crimes and things like that but because she feels like she is an outsider to society and there's quite a lot of the it, it felt very much like i was reading like incel posts uh, because she seems to be like the game is rigged against her she is the a downtrodden member of society she can't do anything to fix this and it's unfair and other people should be punished for it whereas bliss's attitude is very much like yes there are people who are popular and there are people who are not but some of the people who are popular who sandy despises are actually pretty nice they're just trying to be nice to her and and she just reacts very hostilely also um sandy isn't doing anything to help herself there's one particularly gross out moment where bliss goes to a sleepover at her house and there is a full cat litter tray in her closet and lumps of cat poo all over the floor of the closet and Bliss is horrified to discover that what she thought was just a very dusty and unvacuumed carpet is actually dusty with the remnants of mummified cat turds that have been trodden into it. So you can kind of see like there is a case for the fact of it's wrong to pick on people because they're overweight or it's wrong to pick on people because they're poor and they can't afford like the trendy clothes. But at the same time, you're really not helping yourself if you're living in the cat shit graveyard. So there we go. In between the like chapters from Bliss and the pull-out quotes on the black pages, there are also extracts from the diary of SLL. The book would have you believe that this is Sarah Lynn Lancaster's diary, I think, because we find out her full name before we find out Sandy's full name. Sarah Lynn Lancaster is the it girl of the school. She's super popular, super blonde. Uh, she seems at various times, though, to not be having a great time. And the more you find out about her, the more you find out there's a lot of stress and strain put on her. And in some ways, she's just as sick of social convention and expectations as Sandy is. The diary is very disturbing. It talks about a lot of animal cruelty, for one thing. Uh, the person writing it, who is revealed to be Sandy, has a cat, which they are doing experiments on, like starving it or locking it in a cupboard for a really long time. Um, they also talk about blood rituals and sacrifices at one point about breastfeeding a cat. There's a lot of cat stuff, which obviously ties into the Rhymes with Witches aspect because there were a lot of feral cats at the school. And this is kind of also the origin story of those cats. So the diary sections are very disturbing. It quickly becomes apparent that it is Sandy's journal. The book tries to be a little bit coy about that, but there's really no point in being coy about that. One of the things that bothered me about Bliss as a character, and this is probably the only thing that bothered me about her, is that she seemed almost too modern. Uh, so, for example, when going to the high school, she realises there's only one black character in the book, one black attendee at the high school called Lawrence, and everyone sort of treats him as their best friend. And then they talk a little bit about segregation and how other schools have become mixed and how Lawrence is basically there so that they have him so they don't have to become a mixed school because technically they already are and Bliss's response to this is oh so he's like your token black guy and she seems to be very aware of and very critical of the racism that is around her and I don't necessarily believe that she would be as critical as she maybe I don't mean as critical but as unaware of its existence because although she's lived on a commune, that commune did have black people who were in it who would have told her about racism. She's quite close to a lot of them. Uh, like, they talk about other stuff, so why wouldn't they talk about their experiences outside of the commune? Even within the hippie community, I refuse to believe that there was no racism. For the simple reason that even in the most liberal communities now, there is still an astonishing amount of racism. So... It felt a little unbelievable to me. I was okay and on board with her being maybe surprised by some of the like social stuff around it and obviously the existence of the clan in, in, in the southern area where she now is because she's come from a more like northern part of America, but not to the degree that she was. And it kind of wrong-footed me a little bit because it kind of tested my belief in her as a character. But all that aside, I think the book does a good job of examining some of these social things and saying, well, does this make sense? It's a lot about prejudice. It's a lot about popularity, not just in high school, but in general, who gets to be rich, who gets to be poor and who kind of suffers along in the middle. 
Uh, so that, there's that aspect to it as well. The main plot is all about Sandy and her obsession with a girl who died in the nunnery called Liliana, who I might call Liliana because, you know, Dragon Age. Uh, I'm going to trigger warning for mentions of suicide because the story of Liliana is that she was sent to the nunnery because she was an orphan and the family that took her in previously couldn't deal with her because she was a bit weird. So they sent her to the nunnery. She was a bit weird in the sense that she thought she could resurrect her parents with blood magic and not a little bit weird in, say, she put googly eyes on a potato and made it her friend. Um, at the nunnery, she continued to experiment with blood magic, including endangering the, the lives of some of her fellow novices and eventually was locked up in a room on the third floor, which later becomes the room on the third floor from Rhymes with Witches, where they go to leave their offerings. And she jumped out of the window and killed herself rather than be held captive there. Sandy has heard this story from uh, another novice who became a nun who is now in a nursing home where she goes to play the harp. And instead of treating it as like a horrible story, she sees Liliana very much as a victim and someone who she uh, has a lot of in common with. And so she starts trying to reach out to Liliana using blood magic, trying to get some of that power that Liliana was meant to have for herself. Bliss, on the other hand, is naturally... Uh, kind of psychic. She hears Liliana's voice around the school. She occasionally has semi-prophetic dreams and is able to detect extrasensory stuff like uh, the smell of lemons, which is associated with this particular ghost. So right from the moment she starts at the high school, Liliana starts trying to use Bliss to essentially come back, to possess her, to be alive again in some way. And it's only when Bliss refuses to be involved in this, that Sandy gets tapped as a suitable replacement to make this sacrifice to bring Liliana back. And obviously through that, become Lurl the Pearl from Rhymes with Witches, who was revealed at the end of that book to be called Sandy originally, which is what I meant by being spoiled for the sort of events of this book. That's not to say that there are no surprises, like the ending particularly, takes a turn and is very surprising and very dramatic. I will say that it's not so much as a downer as I found the ending of Rhymes with Witches. This one definitely has the more satisfying conclusion in my view. So there is that and this one is definitely also self-contained. You could read this and then not read Rhymes with Witches because I feel like Rhymes with Witches doesn't really add much to the series except more questions which don't go and get answered because this came out in 2008 listed and there has been no third book to kind of talk about the fall of Lil the Pearl, the, the re-establishing of the natural order, which I feel like it needed. Uh, I guess because it's a horror book, they kind of leave that trailing. They don't make everything all right and tuck you into bed at the end of it because it's meant to be scary, but it did feel a little bit unsatisfactory to have some of those questions not answered. And I did feel like the things Sandy does in this book are so shocking and so twisted that Rhymes with Witches is definitely a step back from that and a lot more tame because, you know, it's just stealing hair ribbons and stuff and leaving it in a room. It's not breastfeeding directly from a pregnant cat. I don't know if there's a trigger warning I need to apply before I said that, but that's definitely something that happens in the book. So all in all, I think it's quite an effective horror novel. It kind of reminded me of Stephen King, like early Stephen King, sort of like Carrie, but if it was written by a woman who knew a little bit more about what it was like to be a teenage girl. So if you're into that kind of thing, definitely give it a read. There's a lot of like weird twisted magic stuff in here as well, which is great and quite original in content. I wouldn't say that there's a huge amount in there about witchcraft, although witches are mentioned several times. So... It does have some of that witchy content, but it's not outright about a witch because Bliss herself isn't really a witch. I class her more as a sort of untrained psychic. But there we go. It is a pretty good read. I definitely haven't read anything like it before, so it definitely stands out as a an original idea and concept. If you find a lot of teen witch or magic books to be quite samey, this one stands out on its own and is very different and definitely not something that I will forget anytime soon. And not just because of the cat breastfeeding, which was disturbing.
anywho in the meantime if you'd like to recommend any more books i am keeping a list of them somewhere so if you drop them into the comment section on youtube i will add your suggestions to the list pick through them and then order them when i next run out of books and in the meantime stay tuned for the next episode and i'll see you then bye